Okay, dear friends, I can I, I, I dare to say because I think we're all friends. I'm I'm happy to see this huge family here reunited together at this event of the intergroup of the LGBTI intergroups of the European Parliament. Um, and it's so good to have civil society with us. As I always say, and as we all know, the work as an MEP cannot be done if we do not have the support and and, and the knowledge and the research done by civil society. So I'm very happy that um, uh, OII is here with Dan and Irene, that we have um, ILGA Europe and also NFGM with, um, with Anna. And um, it's good to have you all here. Um, Malin will be here in any minute. It's, so my name is Mark Angel. As you know, I'm the co-chair of the LGBTI intergroup. My pronouns are he, him, and I would like to also invite everyone when, it, when they take the floor to, uh, to just uh, indicate us uh, your pronouns. And uh, I also have to re remind you that this meeting is recorded. So for those who are online and who do not agree with it or who, those who are sitting here, they can go out of the scope of the camera. Or So just to inform you that th this is uh, going to be uh, recorded. Um, so we're speaking about IgM, about intersex uh, genital mutilation, which is, which is a problem not enough known in the European Union, not enough known worldwide, and not enough discussed. And therefore, I'm really so happy to co-host this event together with, um, with uh, uh, Marlin. We all agree that it is a crime what is happening to intersex babies, to intersex children and intersex adolescents. And we are working hard that this can uh, not that this should not happen anymore, not here in Europe. And we also, if you see the LGBTI strategy from the Commission, there is also a dimension, an external dimension to it. We also have a responsibility, not only what we do in here, but also what we do we do um, outside. So we really have to improve the advocacy for 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 in, in within the intergroup we also focus a lot on trans issues and on intersex issues this is very important for us i just saw this little booklet my internet my intersex story and can i tell you my intersex story where i got very involved in all this was when i was a member of national parliament in luxembourg transgender and intersex luxembourg they organized a conference with victims I may call them victims, because and a doctor, a pediatrician, a Swiss pediatrician who was an older man who did a mea culpa in front of that conference, that he realized what harm he had done and what, and this was for me such a, I still get goosebumps if I think of this. This was such a strong moment uh, and an important moment, and um, now being um, being co-chair of the intergroup, often when I'm on tables, people ask me what are you doing, and then I talk about the awareness even within MEPs is quasi zero. I would say that one out of two would say, what is intersex? It's, it's really, even in a political arena. And so we really have to work together and there, thank you again for your work to, to raise awareness. I have a note here with all the numbers. I mean, you are working with it. I'm not gonna repeat the numbers and how, how, how how the, 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 the intersex people are being discriminated, attacked, uh, victims of violence, etc. So I will spare you that because you are fully aware of all, all, all that. You know also the action that the European Union took in 2019 with the resolution on the rights of internet sex people, that was, I think, uh, as, as we can all agree, a step into the right um, direction and uh, and it was very clear that at that point in that resolution the European Parliament expressed its condemnation of sex normalizing treatments and surgery acknowledged that special attention must be given to intersex children and intersex individuals with disability and also highlighted the importance to work together with civil society and that's what we're doing we've been doing that since 2019 and that is very good um, in that resolution, the Parliament also called onto the Commission to reinforce the intersex uh, dimension in its multi-annual LGBTI list of actions. And again, we find ourselves calling onto the Commission now to diversify the scope of their work and encourage at the women uh, um, uh, violence against, the violence against women directive and the domestic violence directive that the scope has to be enlarged. And here I have some good news. Yesterday, uh, there was technical meetings uh, in the Libe committee and uh, the amendments who include um, 
genital mutilation on intersex person has been integrated into, into the compromise amendments. So that's already agreed. We still have to have a vote in the committee, of course, and then a vote in the plenary. But I think this is already, it's in the compromises. And I can assure you that all the progressive forces, and it goes beyond the progressive forces, because I think Frances Fitzgerald, from, who is a progressive EPP person, she's also in this uh, compromise. So I think we're going to fight very, very hard to, uh, to keep that Amendment 6A in, in, into, that, into that legislation, because that would be of utmost importance. We also had a success this morning in the Employment Committee, where we just give an opinion on this directive. And there was a, quite a lot of um, amendments to change the vocabulary from in all the articles when we talk about violence against women as gender-based violence. And this was also accepted with a big, big, big majority. And maybe another important inf my information which might be important for you is that in the AFCO committee, the Committee of Constitutional Affairs, we work, the Parliament works on the conclusions of the Conference on the Future of Europe. And you know the conclusions on the Conference on the Future of Europe. Most of these recommendations can be done by policy change and by directives and, re and regulations, but a little bit needs treaty change. And there is also within the progressive persons in AFCO committee, when they really have to, to in their report, put what are, the, what, what are the, the, the articles, where do we change? There is also willingness to, to work on the gender questions, because as you know, uh, uh, gender identity and sex characteristics are not part yet of, of, of mentioned. And I think this is also something we have to follow and where progressive forces will push to make that, uh, to make that uh, happen. Um, so we will fight for the inclusion of all genders in our human rights discourse. This is, this is very important. Maybe another, uh, another advancement which we reached uh, because on Monday, the Council finally gave the last blessing to the Pay Transparency Directive. This is this directive to close the gender pay gap. We managed for the first time to have in a legislative text the mention of intersectional discrimination. Unfortunately, we didn't get it in the articles, but we got it in the recitals at least, and we had to fight very hard in the trilogues to get that, but it's in the recitals. So this gives it also strength with the European Court of Justice. And we mentioned also, we have a very gender inclusive language where, um, because the legal basis is the treaty from 1958, where it says equality, equal pay for equal work between men and women. But then there is a lot of case law from the European Court of Justice who has defined the concept of men and women. So when we talk about men and women in that text, it's men and women in all their diversity. And this diversity is very linear. So, and we also mention uh, uh, non-binary persons and, uh, and, and it's, it's quite very, in, uh, very, very, I think, uh, very uh, good legislation. And, and, and so, and I'm happy that it passed the council that it wasn't, wasn't blocked. I mean, thank God it didn't need unanimity, otherwise it wouldn't have passed it, but it's there. And step by step, I think we have to continue work on it. And here I want, want really to thank also the, the Miguel from our secretariat who always sends voting alerts. Also this morning in Ample Committee, the, the most members got, a, got a, a voting alert that we have to vote these amendments to make, to change the text from violence against women to gender-based violence. And uh, it was quite successful, Miguel, so uh, thank you very much. Oh, no, you didn't send a voting alert. We, <laughs> we were supposed to, but we did. Sorry. For yeah, for plenary, he does that. But sorry, sorry, sorry. But he, pa he, he alerted my office and he alerted other MEPs. And in our working groups, we alerted the colleagues. So he does that for the plenary, but sorry. But anyway, so... Um, but it was you who, who, who reminded us that we, we have to underline this. But maybe we can then do a little round, uh, un tour de table to introduce every, everyone can introduce him, herself, themselves. And then, uh, and then when Marlene comes, she will take over to go into um, the moderation and the discussion with our esteemed guests here from civil society. So I already presented myself. Uh, so Dan. Thanks, Mark. I'm Dan Christian Gattas. I'm the executive director of OI Europe, which is the intersex umbrella organization working for intersex people's human rights in Europe. And my pronouns are he, him, or they, they. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Irene Amoroso, policy officer of OII Europe, and my pronoun is uh, she. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Anna Wittgen. I'm the director of NFGM European Network. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. So we will have some presentations by our co-hosts from the civil society, and I start with Dan and Irene for um, uh, OIII Europe. Thank you, Mark. Actually, the, the first OI was founded in a French-speaking country, so maybe that's the reason why. Um, well, thank you very much, and let me start by thanking, first of all, LDBTI Intergroup Vice President and Liebe Shadow Rapporteur um, for the file we already talked about, Malin Björk, um, and then the LGBTI Intergroup and FGM ILGA Europe for co-hosting this event. Thank you very much, um, Mark Angel, for your wonderful introduction and, and opening speech uh, and, and the wonderful news that you brought to us, which are really amazing. Um, and for us, this is, for us as well, I hope this is also really like a, a milestone event um, to be able to speak to you about IGM, but also to do this in a setting where we are together with NDFGM, with the LGBT Intergroup and with this whole setup. This is really remarkable. Um, so thank you very much for this and thank you to all of you who are here uh, in person and also online for being with us. Um, my colleague Irene and I we will uh, share the task of presenting why of the intervention. And what we would like to do is to discuss with you why IGM is gender-based uh, violence and why it falls under the scope of the Directive on Violence Against Women and Girls and Domestic Violence. Um, as you know, intersex people are people with variation of sex characteristics, that is, people that are born with sex characteristics that do not fit the typical definition of male or female. Um, and in the European Union today, as you already said, um, Mark, intersex infants and children continue to be subjected to intersex genital mutilation, so to IGM. And IGM is defined as non-vital surgical or medical interventions or hormonal treatments that aim to alter the intersex infants, the intersex child, the intersex adolescents, sex characteristics without their wish and personal prior free and fully informed consent. And IGM has been identified as a harmful practice and a fundamental rights violation by the European Parliament, as we already heard, by the European Commission and by bodies like the Commissioner for Human Rights um, and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and many UN treaty bodies, among others. And despite all of this, the practice still continues in Europe as of this day. Yeah, thank you so much. So as Dan was saying, this practice uh, continues in Europe um, still um, today. In the 2019 FRA LGBTI survey, 62% of intersex respondents who were subjected to surgery on their sex characteristics reported that they had not given consent. Uh, and we know from reports that uh, while I, um, IGM is most common intersex children, intersex adults, including intersex women, have been subjected on, uh, to IGM on the basis of incomplete, biased, and even deliberately false information. Two German full case studies about surgical interventions on children with variations of sex characteristics aged 0 to 10 are available. Uh, and the most recent one from 2019 had the objective to investigate whether there had been a decline uh, in so-called feminizing and so-called masculinizing surgeries in intersex children aged 0 to 10 um, between the 2005 and 2016. Um, the conclusion of this study is that the number of such operations has remained re relatively constant over the years under review and also found that the average number of surgeries performed uh, per year was 1,871. The relative frequency, that is the frequency of interventions in relation to the number of intersex-related diagnoses uh, of so-called feminizing surgeries, was found to range between 20 and 42 percent in the years under review. Um, a 2017 UK study showed that over 450 0 to 14-year-old intersex children had so-called atypical gonadal tissue removed in 2014 and 2015, and that this number actually had increased compared to previous years. In 2022, 
an inquiry of the Polish Commissioner for Human Rights to the Polish Ministry of Health revealed statistics according to which thousands of surgeries on the sex characteristics of persons with variations of sex characteristics are performed each year. The European Parliament, uh, in its 2021 resolution on identifying gender-based violence as a new area of crime, qualified intersex genital mutilations as a form of gender-based violence and a form of femicide, and has called on member states to ban female and intersex genital mutilation. The Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women has repeatedly shown concern about reports of IGM cases in, the, in EU member states and has recommended that state parties adopt clear legislative provisions explicitly prohibiting the performance of unnecessary surgical or other medical treatment on intersex children until they reach an age at which they can provide their free, prior and informed consent. But still, as of today, only five EU member states have adopted legislation to prohibit IGM. Malta, Portugal, Germany, Greece, and most recently Spain. IGM is indeed a form of gender-based violence because it is performed with the purpose of making the body of a child with a variation of sex characteristics fit the medical and societal norms of what is understood to be a typical female or male body, including its appearance, function, and expression of the future adult's sexuality. IGM performed on children, in particular but not limited to intersex children assigned female, presents some specificities and evident connections with other forms of violence against women and girls, such as female genital mutilation, FGM. Similar to FGM, IGM against women and girls is aimed at exerting social control over the girls' and future women's physical appearance and over their sexuality. One of its unconcealed goals is, as quoted in medical articles, to improve the cosmetic appearance of the genitals and to a law for vaginal penile intercourse. And indeed, uh, so-called feminizing interventions include vaginoplasties, clitoral reduction or recession, and plastic reconstruction, so the vulva, on infants and young children with variations of sex characteristics who were assigned female at birth. Similarly, intersex children assigned male are operated on because their sex characteristics do not conform with societal standards of maleness. Um, they are, to say it bluntly, considered to be female and hence in need to be fixed. What lies behind these assumptions is the very same misogynistic mindset that leads to intimate partner violence, rape, and other forms of violence against women and girls. So as Irene just explained, intersex gender mutilation is a form of gender-based violence very clearly because it is motivated by harmful gender stereotypes and it's enacted through violent, harmful practices which aim to exert social control over the intersex child and young adolescents and future adults' body and sexuality. Article 83.1 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union includes the area of crime, sexual exploitation of women and children. So it's really important to underline that <coughs> IGM is performed mostly on infants and young children, and to an extent on older minors and young adults, which in essence mean on peace persons with an increased vulnerability, vulner this is a difficult word, vulner <laughs> vulnerability, <laughs> it's also difficult because a quite, it's a quite difficult topic, um, who are vulnerable due to, her, to their young age and more likely, therefore, to fall victim to social stigma, pressure, misinformation, and discrimination because of being intersex. And in addition, as minors, intersex children are dependent on their parents and legal guardians, which makes them specifically vulnerable to being subjected to harmful practices and to violence in a domestic setting, also in the sense that parents authorize, often based on false information or incomplete information, those um, um, interventions on their children. This power imbalance is exuberated by the fact that this position of vulnerability is increased through societal norms. The intersex child and person's body is unjustly taken advantage of because their bodies are the battlefield on which a society which views their bodies as non-normative exerts its power to perpetuate sexism and misogyny by subjecting them to IGM. It's like misogynist norms are literally transcribed and inscribed onto intersex people's bodies because those bodies challenge the existence of these norms 
and are therefore perceived as a threat to the system and to society. The Directive on Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence therefore presents a landmark opportunity to ensure that minimal standards are set so that harmful practices like IGM are criminalized in all member states. And this includes ensuring that intersex women and children who have already been exposed to such harmful practices are able to access justice and specialized support and that they are counted as victims at heightened risk of violence. And preventive measures should also be included, ranging from training and awareness raising in cooperation with civil society. The text of the directive, and even more so with the good news that you just um, gave to us, addresses already the widespread inequity that is still deeply rooted in our society and of which gender-based violence and the specific vulnerability of women and sex gender minorities are one of the most horrifying aspects. Including the just mentioned provisions would have a tremendous impact on intersex persons' lives across the European Union, and it would help to address a serious violation to anybody's rights. Thank you. I will then give um, Anna the floor, and um, Anna, you're from for, for, for Cyrus. Anna is from NFGM European Network. Anna. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you also. I'm so pleased to be here uh, representing uh, the NFGM European Network uh, today. Um, and I would really like to thank, uh, to begin with, of course, uh, Matt Nefer for, um, well, stepping in and moderating, but for co-hosting this event, as well as, of course, Marlene Björk uh, when she arrives. Uh, the LGBT intergroup uh, and uh, OI Europe and uh, ILGA Europe for inviting us to be part of this really timely conversation and important initiative. Um, we feel it's really important uh, to be here as allies in this conversation. Um, and, but to begin with, please allow me just to introduce uh, the NFGM European Network for those who are not familiar with us. We are um, a European network with 35 organizations across 16 different European countries, uh, all who we are the driving force for the European movement to end female genital mutilation, um, connecting civil society um, across Europe, starting from community based organizations to larger organizations, all with the same, um, well, aim to um, have a vision of the world free from female genital mutilation where women and girls are empowered and can be fully enjoying their human rights. But we do see that genital mutilations overall are a gross human rights violation. Uh, they violate the basic human rights of bodily autonomy, dignity of human beings, their sexual health and reproductive rights, as well as the right to life. Um, we know uh, that female genital mutilation is globally recognized as such, and also thanks to the tireless work of civil society, <coughs> uh, such as our founding members, um, FGM has now been very high on the European agenda uh, for a decade. In fact, uh, this year we will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of the first ever European Commission communication outlining uh, for the first time, a European strategy towards the elimination of female genital mutilation. Um, so we are incredibly grateful to the allies at uh, European level, in particular, this house, <laughs> the European Parliament, um, that are, of course, the elected representatives of the European people for the incredibly strong commitments that have been shown and the engagement made to advance in the cause of eliminating FGM, both internally and externally, working towards uh, the goal of um, 5.3 of the SDGs. Today, um, among the 200 million women and girls worldwide who live with the consequences of FGM, six, over 600,000 are in Europe um, and 190,000 are at risk um, of undergoing the practice. So this is why prevention as well as, of course, protection measures are essential uh, for the sustainable eradication of the root causes of FGM. Um, the directive that we are here discussing today has a very comprehensive text. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, but from the perspective of FGM, it is focusing not only on the criminalization aspect in Article 6, and now hopefully 6A will also <laughs> um, be included um, as well. But it also looks, and for 
more, which is also very important from our standpoint, on the efficient prevention, on the training of professionals, and specialized support services for survivors, among other things. And these aspects are truly fundamental. Uh, the proposal also correctly states that FGM is an exploitative practice performed for the purpose of preserving and asserting domination over women and girls and to exert social control over the girls' and women's sexuality. This, I bring this up in particular because it does remind us that we are tackling the reasons why FGM um, happens uh, and in the world. It reminds us why it exists and continues to exist and the root causes. And of course, the root causes are very linked with the same root causes of IgM. Um, so we can immediately see that FGM also, I mean, form um, one of the myths is that it's an Africa issue. It's not, it exists in 90 countries globally, over 90 countries. And it's also an issue, not an issue just of the other or you know, some communities. It's something that really affects us all because it is, deeply rooted in sexist beliefs, in harmful gender stereotypes, and harmful the corresponding harmful gender norms. And I think the root causes is what we really need to um, look at and try and com combat, as this assigns specific duties, narrow identities, and limited rights based on the sex characteristics of a person on the gender they are assigned at birth. Um, so we also want to um, call on the directive to explicitly prohibit performing FGM in a medical setting. Um, and this, of course, is in line uh, with, I mean, the, with many um, different reports and strategies, but also what the WHO global strategy to stop healthcare providers from performing female genital mutilation. Um, so as has been said, um, IGM is an intervention, including operations of medical system sex assignment to ensure sexual normalization of children born with sex characteristics which do not fit the culturally accepted norms of women or men despite most intersex children being in good health. So since the pra this practice can involve the partial or total removal of genitalia, it is performed to conform bodies to gender norms to become socially acceptable and has similar negative impacts in terms of trauma, physical pain, psychological consequences, and shows great similarities in such a sense to female genital mutilation. So for us, we are, we really do feel that it's important that IGM be included in the directive um, in line with also what the um, European Parliament has already committed that we should be condemning um, IGM, but also with the UN Child Rights Committee, um, who also condemns um, FGM and IGM as child rights violations. Uh, so it is a form of child abuse, and it is uh, often a practice carried out on children, as has been stated before. Um, it can also be argued that there are cases in which FGM and IGM are concurrently performed. Um, in the case of some intersex girls undergoing for example, clitoridectomy with the purpose, if they come from an FGM affected community, of course, but of the purpose of marriageability or social inclusion. Um, we are very aware as also of intersecting forms of oppression um, and discriminations that FGM affected communities can uh, be impacted by. And we are increasingly adopting when we work and how we do on intersectional lens um, and in fact, within this approach, we have discussed uh, in an infographic that we actually brought today, so if anyone wants it, I have extra copies, that we produced with ILGA Europe um, that looks at also why the allyship with these two causes are both necessary, but also very natural. Um, we in general, as a network and our members, continue and to tirelessly work to de deconstruct the gender stereotypes that are the basis of gender-based violence, such as FGM and IGM. And we feel that tackling the harmful gender norms which exist in our society and applying gender transformative approaches is imperative in order to fight gender-based violence. Just to quickly sum up, FGM is rooted in gender um, stereotypes, so is IGM. FGM is rooted in the notion that in order to be acceptable as a woman, you must be in a certain way 
so is IgM. FGM is a form of ill treatment, so is IgM. FGM is a form of child abuse, so is IgM. FGM is a human rights violation, so is IgM. And FGM is a gender-based violence, and so is IgM. So it is high time that we stopped all forms of genital mutilation and protect all people's rights to bodily integrity and autonomy. Um, please, thank you so much for inviting us out here today, and we are very pleased to be here supporting this cause. Also, many thanks to you, Anna. This was also very interesting, and uh, this allyship, as you mentioned, is very important. And and um, you mentioned we have to tackle the root causes and the gender stereotypes. And this is why also we in the intergroup and also with the children's rights group, we defend sex and relationship education, age adapted, as it is mentioned in the International Charter of the Children's Right. It's so important to have age adapted, comprehensive sex and relationship education. And, um, and all, this is also under attack in some countries by some governments. So this is part of the work we also do to try to, to, to fight these uh, gender stereotypes. Having said that, I will give pass the floor to Marlene. No need to apologize. I know how busy you are. And Marlene is really a wonderful champion in the Libe Committee when it comes to our cause here. She's been wonderful working on the file on rainbow families where we work together on this file with many as, as, as um, Cyrus, Pina, and many, many others, uh, Evan, uh, Francis, and, and, and also colleagues from Renew are very active, and other colleagues from the Greens. So thank you very much, Marling. Thank you very much, uh, and for, for uh, always being uh, an ally, uh, making these linkages between like gender equality and LGBTI uh, rights that we, we try to do uh, in the intergroup also. Okay, we have an online speaker, um, Akram, one of our co-hosts from Ilga Europe, who would like to take the floor. Thanks, Akram. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Akram Kuban Svekov. Uh, I'm a senior advocacy officer at Yoga Europe. And I just wanted to make some points regarding when uh, Elsa Malin mentioned about the uh, uh, upcoming uh, procedural steps, uh, which would be the in, in the current trilogue. I think that one of the questions might be about the legal basis and uh, why IGM would be uh, uh, under the scope of this uh, legal basis. Uh, and I would like to just send some arguments in support of, uh, uh, in support of this. Uh, firstly, it was already mentioned, but I just wanted to sum up some of the, uh, some of the points. Firstly, IGM is often performed on the uh, intersex women and girls uh, with the aim of creating bodies uh, that are capable of uh, heterosexual and penetrative sex, which was mentioned. and. Uh, and frequently long before the individual has the opportunity to express either their uh, gender identity or sexual orientation. And uh, this presumption that intersex women and girls will need bodies that will look and function in the same way as bodies of heterosexual uh, endosex women, meaning that uh, endosex is uh, uh, opposite of the uh, intersex, uh, it's enforced uh, without individual's consent and uh, frequently irreversibly. Uh, and this non-consensual modification of a child's or woman's body for sexual purposes is a clear violation of their bodily autonomy and uh, cause significant physical and psychological harm to the individual, resulting in, in uh, uh, sexual uh, uh, suffering uh, later in, in their life. And um, so that's why it can be uh, seen as a, a form of the sexual uh, exploitation. And as it was already mentioned by uh, Dan, that um, as in the case of FGM, uh, as uh, uh, with, with the legal analysis, we can see that uh, exploitation uh, of the vulnerability uh, can be uh, as a, as a also additional argument because IGM is often performed on children who are already, by the virtue of being children, underage, and not being able to consent, are vulnerable. Uh, and uh, furthermore, the practice of IGM is often driven by patriarchal and cultural beliefs uh, that stigmatize intersex individuals uh, and reinforce harmful stereotypes. And this contributes to a culture of uh, discrimination and violence against intersex people, and particularly intersex women and girls, because it also will intersex with this, uh, intersect with the sexism. And uh, such beliefs uh, are also similar to those 
underlie uh, uh, female genital mutilation, which already was uh, also mentioned by the Anna in other forms of sexual exploitation, uh, which are both based on uh, harm, harmful gender stereotypes and aim to exert control over a person's sexuality and physical appearance. And finally, IGM can increase the vulnerability of intersex uh, women and girls to sexual exploitation and abuse uh, because it can lead to feelings of shame and isolation and making them more susceptible to sexual violence or harassment or uh, uh, exploitation. Such experiences can create a sense of uh, vulnerability and powerlessness, which can make intersex individuals, especially women and girls, uh, more susceptible to sexual exploitation and abuse. And in conclusion, I just wanted to say that intersex genital mutilation performed on women and children can be uh, seen as a form of sexual exploitation, uh, as it involves a non-consensual modification of a person's body for sexual purposes, and is often mo motivated by harmful cultural uh, and especially patriarchal beliefs, uh, which are similar to those uh, who, which uh, underlies the uh, female genital mutilation. I will stop here, uh, and thank you for your attention. I think, uh, you know, the fact that, that we have this coalition between different political groups in the European Parliament, with the intergroup, with FGM Europe, and I was hoping I heard that, that uh, our colleague from the Child uh, Children Rights intergroup could not make it, but please, we will continue to reach out to them, and we can do that together, because I think they must come on board and they have to be an active player. Uh, with that said, um, I look forward to, you know, make sure that it comes through the way we want it to in the directive, in the text, uh, and at the same time continue to do the kind of work and, and coalitions between, between our, our different, um, you know, platforms to make sure that this is not lost along the way then when we come to, the, to, to potential trialogues. Uh, and uh, uh, by having had host this seminar, we want you to know that you are have your space in the European Parliament together with uh, the intergroup, of course. Okay, I think I close this meeting here now. Thank you all of you for coming, for your contributions, for the political work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.